this computer. Okay. Uh, we're recording. Good. All right. So, um, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Lord, we bless you and thank you. Uh, this book of James will continue to challenge us, um, but um, also encourage us. So we ask, Lord, that um, we'll experience um, that any good letter like this should afflict the comfortable and comfort the afflicted. And we're all of them both. And we ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Now, this uh, chapter two deals a lot with what uh, some translations call the sin of partiality. Sometimes it, 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 it calls it, um, you know, uh, showing favoritism. Mm -hmm. um, and those are both valid, certainly valid translations. Prosopolemsia is, is the Greek word, and it literally means a respecter of persons. Um, and uh, I don't know if either one of you two seminarians, I have a, I can't really parse it in the sense that I almost see the word prosopon in there, which means like a person's face or, or some, in other words, it isn't just about wealth, but maybe good looks, <laughs> but all that's just a way of saying that, um, uh, this, this first section is going to deal with that problem. And, you know, if, if we think we don't have it in our churches, um, we do. Uh, it, it may be more subtle than what's described here, but, you know, <laughs> for example, someone someone comes and maybe they're visiting. We're, oh, we're welcoming them at the door, but uh, come on, you're welcome. Come in. Don't sit in my pew. <laughs> or, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, but or sometimes, again, if a person is, um, um, when I say dress poorly, I, I, I mean, um, you know, it, it looks like they might be out for trouble, you know, of the criminal class. We all get nervous and clutch the purses and, you know, and some of that fear is understandable, but again, um, it, 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 it remains, you know, a struggle. I remember I used to go out to the boys in the hood out when I was at St. Thomas More and they'd be hanging out in the street corner near St. Thomas More. And, and I said, um, Hey, yo homies, you know, don't chill here. Don't clock here, hang tough here or sell rocks here. But what you could do is come on into church with me. <laughs> You know, I thought to myself, if they really did come in, people would be clutching their purses and worrying. And say, What's Father doing? What are you bringing them in here for? You know, that kind of a thing. And again, I think it's more rooted in fear because, you know, they were they were basically gang members and so on. I remember when I was in the Virgin Islands, uh, there were these guys hanging out in front of Holy Family Church there. And I, I said, you guys are really holy. I mean, look how long you pray. You're here all day long in front of the church, just praying. And they started laughing at me. And uh, uh, I said, what do you mean? For I said, well, this is a church and the blessed sacraments in there. You're just, you're just feet away from the Lord of the universe. And they kind of look at me, what's what you don't preach it? Go on now. <laughs> you know, sending me on my way. But, um, but anyway, I, I, I just felt like, uh, you know, we, we, um, if they walk, if someone like that walks into the church, a lot of us get startled. But also, how hard do we work to get them into the church, you know, and things like that. So, I think all of these are, are legitimate questions for us, and we all have to be prudent. Um, just walking up to somebody you don't even know on the street who might be a gang member or look kind of like a tough guy, you know, uh, that kind of stuff um, might not be always the most prudent thing to do. But I of, I've often wondered, you know, how do we? Uh, how do we reach people like that? You see, and anyway, so that's just a preliminary. Okay, so let's um, let's get started here. Uh, would, would anybody like to read uh, tonight? Oh, did I see anybody? Okay, I'll get started then. Okay, um, my brothers, show no partiality as you hold the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of Glory. For if a man wearing a gold ring and fine clothing comes into your assembly and a poor man in shabby clothing also comes in and you pay attention to, and if you pay attention to the one who wears the fine clothing and say, you sit here in a good place while you say to the poor man, you stand over there or sit down at my feet. <laughs> Have you not then made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Um, now let's just stop there for a moment. You know, again, um, uh, you know, we, we tend to call these, the, you know, words like discrimination or, you know, showing favoritism and so on. Um, and uh, granted, uh, we're going to 
pay more attention to people we know. Um, and we're, 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 you know, one of the, I, I, had, I had a parish council meeting about three years ago, and I said, to, I said to them, I want every one of you to intentionally, every Sunday, go up to somebody that you don't know and introduce yourself. You know, and every time we come back to the parish council, okay, anyone? Uh, did? Nope, nope, no, forgot about that. Well, no. <laughs> you know, we... We hang kind of close to people we know. And I, I, I said, well, you're parish council members. I, I want you to kind of um, go and strike up a little conversation with somebody. Because what I wanted them to do was to say, well, look, um, hi, I'm, I'm so-and-so. I'm on the parish council. Uh, I don't think I know your name, but, uh, you know, tell me a little bit about yourself, you know, and, and then maybe try to seek to unite them to one of the parish organizations. Or, you know, maybe there's something they'd like to do in the church, you know, and get them connected. Because, you know, we have like in any parish, you know, we have the usual, you know, core group of, you know, 200 or maybe 150 people. And then there's a lot of pew sitters who don't really ever get involved in much of anything. And I often wonder, well, why not? Maybe some, nobody's ever asked them. And so I used to take it upon myself to go up and ask some people to join different things. But, um, but I said to the parish council, this is really, I want you to make this your job. So they, they, and, you know, we, I tried for like five months and every, every month it was the same thing. No one had met with anybody. So, um, so I, I, I wanted to show you is that it's not always that you sit over there and I'll stand, you know, you're, you're fawning over the person with the gold rings, but sometimes it's more subtle, isn't it? You know, and um, most of you who are parishioners here know we're in a parish that's, that's in a neighborhood that's changing ethnically and racially quite a bit. And again, um, that creates a lot of fear. Uh, it creates a lot of, you know, anxiety uh, about, you know, well, nobody likes change, you know, and it's, it's, it, and so these, these types of things are all, you know, part of uh, being, being in a, in, a, in a city parish these days. So anyway, just, these are just some of the tension. I think we've handled that as gracefully as we can here. Um, and we're keeping our tradition, but we're also welcoming uh, new members, uh, and uh, some of them look a lot like me. <laughs> um, and, in other words, they're white, <laughs> and others are Hispanic, and others are, you know, from different countries. Uh, well, one of the new youth leaders is from Bolivia, you know. So anyway, my only point in saying all that is that um, um, I think as a parish we've done, we've handled it pretty well. Um, but as I say, it, it's not always the case in every parish or in every interaction. So. Um, so we, we see here then, um, if you've only paid attention, verse three, to the one who wears fine clothes, you, you see it in a good place. Oh, I'm, I'm going down here. Verse five, um, have you not then made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Um, what, what, do you think, what do you think that means practically? We don't often think of favoritism as necessarily a form of judgment, but it is, isn't it? And remember, I think, you know, we tried to be careful uh, to not judge persons as much as to judge behavior, right? Um, we, um, uh, we don't always know. Um, I, one of the uh, most uh, traditional Catholics I know, I mean, loves the Latin mass. He's all tatted up, you know, he, uh, he, he wears these sort of sleeveless uh, t-shirts and, you know, a kind of a motorcycle rider, all that kind of stuff. Uh, and he loves the Latin mass. <laughs> Who would have thunk it? You know, I mean, uh, and uh, he's very, very serious about, you know, liturgy and worship. And uh, yeah, like I said, his arms are all tat, you know, tattooed. And, you know, he's, he's, he's the exact opposite of what you would think. Uh, let, me, let me mute some people here. You need a lighter? Mute. Yeah. All right, good. So, uh, I mean, again, appearances can be deceiving. And of course, there's another line in the scripture that says, man sees the appearance, but God looks into the heart. We may look at a person who seems poor and think and conclude, well, maybe they don't know much or they're not intelligent and find out they're very intelligent. Um, the, um, on the grand jury, um, we dealt with a very sad case. I can only talk in very gen gen general terms, but there was a... Um, an African-American man who was killed by, well, he, he, he was schizophrenic and he was having an episode. And this, this man on the bus, we, you know, they have cameras on the bus. So we saw all this stuff on the cameras. 
Uh, he he didn't really hit a, a young woman, but he kind of came close to, you know, kind of threatening her. And she called her father, and her father, he was, he was right there in the neighborhood, met the guy, and I'm sorry to say, literally beat him to death. And we had to watch that on the camera. He took a stick and just beat him and stomped him and stomped him until he was dead. And uh, that's why I told you sometimes I'd have to come down and just cry. You know, sit, sit in the chapel after grand jury duty and just cry. Come to find out this guy who was schizophrenic, you know, he had dreadlocks, you know, the, the usual things that you'd sort of expect in some inner city African-American men. Come to find out um, that he had a doctoral degree. He was a violinist and um, he, he had a degree in engineering um, and a very fine artist. And a, and a well, a slight, not well known, but in certain circles, a well known jazz musician as well. And so you think this this guy's schizophrenic? He's mentally out of it. Uh, you know, he has. Um, um, you know, you, you would never know any of that by looking at this guy. And we were really shocked when we heard, you know, his background and what a. And of course, you know, my my sister was schizophrenic. I can just say that not schizophrenics aren't always going scra screaming crazy. If they stay on their meds, you know. They can get. They can often get along pretty well, um, and um, uh, they just, you know, you just got to make sure they keep taking their medicines. But uh, at the end of the day, um, again, you would never think that this guy had a degree in engineering to look at him. Um, you'd never think that uh, he was a violinist as well as a jazz musician. Um, you wouldn't know any of that. You just say, well, this is a kind of a, a crazy guy who's living on the streets and uh, a homeless guy or something. All right. So one final story. Um, when I was in seminary, um, there was a, a woman, uh, we had a mountain poor apostolate. So Mount St. Mary Cemetery, Seminary is right, right at the base of, a, of the Appalachians, the Catoctin Range. And up in the hills and the mountains, there uh, would be a lot of very poor people some of them didn't even have indoor plumbing and things like that. So we would go and visit with them, bring them food and see what they needed and so on, maybe medicine. So there was this woman that we visited who had kind of lost it. Um, she lived in, in an old log cabin, um, but she only lived in the back section where the kitchen was. The rest of the house had been given over to chickens and cats and other you know, it was quite, a, it, the place was just, you know, to walk into, it was just suffocating with, with cat urine and, uh, and, and then all the, 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 what do you call all the dust that, uh, that these chickens would make. And she lived on a couch sitting there in the, in the kitchen. Um, and um, uh, when we met her, um, we realized that she was a little mentally out of it. I mean, she was, she could hold a conversation and all, but uh, something had gone wrong in her life come to find out she had been a pretty high ranking government official uh, in the labor department uh, for many years. Um, and uh, her, her family had, she just disowned her family. Uh, there was some kind of disagreement among them, but there she was, she was very poor and we would run and get her medicine. She had cancer. So eventually she died. Um, come to find out she had $6 million and she donated it all to the local Catholic parish. So uh, again, you just never know. <laughs> now say never know but you see this this idea um that we we make quick judgments about appearances and um based on little else than appearance is is a um common human trait and part of it is we're a little bit like cats we're wary and we come into a scene and we need to size it up quickly to feel safe but you have to remember that even though that's a good survival thing we um we need to be careful that we, we give some second thoughts to those things, not just think we sized up everything so quickly, you know? And, you know, we also have the problem in our culture where we do the opposite, where we think that um, we, we're very quick to think someone's a really great person with very little evidence and come to find out that they're not so great. Or remember, uh, some of you remember Father Karapi from years ago? He was a very renowned Catholic preacher and priest, and he said it all, he, and traditional, and he's out there, you know, toeing the line and all this kind of stuff. And to come, you know, to come to find out he's living a double life, he, had a, he was shacked up with a woman up in Idaho, and um, um, he was, you know, quite a heavy user of, of drugs, and um, um, was living the life of Riley, he had millions of dollars he'd collected, he had boats, and, you know, just, you know, and people were like really shocked. 
But honestly, what did most people know about Father Karapi? You know, they just knew he was a good preacher. Um, but, you know, he told a little bit that at one point in, earlier in his life, he had struggled with addiction and overcome it. But that's about all he said. Um, but we make quick conclusions. Just because he's a great preacher, he must be a grand, a, a living saint. And, and we're shocked. We're shocked and horrified when we find out that this guy had some real trouble going on in his life. Uh, just being a good preacher isn't, isn't enough evidence, okay? So anyway, my, my point in saying these things, both positive and negative, sometimes we're quick to put people up on a pedestal. I think, wow, only to discover, uh, hmm, uh, they had some things going on I wasn't aware of, you know? Um, and uh, we do the other thing, too, where we demote people very quickly just by appearances and on very little evidence, okay? So um, any, anyone want to share any quick story or just an uh, example of, that you can think of, you know, or maybe if it's not too embarrassing? <laughs> Monsignor. Yeah. Excuse me, this is Karen. Um, when we used to um, in survey up at some, yeah. um, some is always well known or said that these are homeless people. Mm -hmm. And um, and that would always bother me because everyone that comes in some is not homeless. Right. And in talking to a man one day, he said to me, you know, I asked him, he had on a construction hat and I said, oh, you're working today? And he said, yes. Mm -hmm. And he said, I come here to some to eat lunch mm -hmm. because if I eat at home with my children, I'm taking something out of their mouths. Oh yeah, right. Yeah. And <clears throat> so I was trying to tell, you know, some of the the even some of the kids thought, you know, everyone that comes in there is homeless, but they're not. And um I always say, you don't know my story mm -hmm. behind me coming to mm -hmm. some, because you have some lawyers that come through there. Mm -hmm. You have people dressed up in suits, very intelligent people, but they're hungry, mm -hmm. just like you and I. And unfortunately, they may not have food in their refrigerator and the meals that we prepare for them may just get them through until the end of the month until their next paycheck comes. Right, right. So, you know, that's a, when you said that, it kind of brought me back to some. And um, so I, I kind of frown when I my beer, people say homeless because everyone is not homeless because sometimes when we're preparing the food, a lot of, you know, we'll eat afterwards and we're not homeless, <laughs> you know, so, right, right, right. you know, that was just something I thought about when, um, yeah. when you said that okay. it just brought to my mind. So again, man sees the appearance, the Lord looks into the heart. Um, you know, there's a beautiful old spiritual, nobody knows the trouble I've seen, nobody but Jesus. You know, so we don't know everybody's story either. And um, so all of those are ways of saying that sometimes we think, well, look at that guy over there, you know, he's living in the street, running, the, running things uh, around. But, uh, you know, um, we, we don't know his whole story. And, um, um, you know, we just say, well, he's a ne'er-do-well, but there may be more to the story. Yeah, but I don't, I think um, it's totally the wrong way. I mean, especially um, from that perspective is that even that, like you talked about your church and you're changing and so forth and people are afraid or whatever. Okay, I could get afraid because you're, you don't, can't handle um, strangers, you don't know them and so forth. But from that perspective, when they walk in that church, what you represent when you walk in that church and who you are, everyone is representing the same thing. And when you think and you act and in the way you talk there, it's, you forget why you're in the building. 
if that's how you're going to act because you're in the building with the Lord and rich or poor, they're all sinners, no different than you. And that's all they are. And I, I just think that we lose the fact of status and all that, but it doesn't make any difference. Why do I care what you are, what you do? Once you're in that room with me and so forth, you're coming to do the same thing I am. I'm a sinner coming to see the Lord. And that's all it is. And I think we need to focus more on that than yeah. worry about who and what people are and stuff. Yeah, right. All right. Well, I think, um, um, yeah, so what we, he's going to move on into a new section here, um, you know, that, that builds on this a bit. Um, but I, before we do it, just again, just that, that final idea that, again, um, the word respect is a very interesting word in, in, in uh, English. It comes, anytime you put an R-E in front of a word, it means to do something again, right? Again. So, and specto, spectare, from the Latin to look or to see. So, look and look again. That's respect. You know, you just look and just say, well, you know, or, or do you look and then look again? Okay, so that's at the heart of respect is this very idea of regarding a person um, and not just looking away, but looking again. All right. So, all right. Now, um, we have here. Um, let's see. Um, you sit here. You sit there. Uh, listen, my brothers has not got. Okay, now we're picking up with verse five. Listen, my beloved brothers, has not God chosen those who are poor in the world to be rich in faith and heirs to the kingdom, which he has promised to those who love him? But you have dishonored the poor man. Are not the rich ones the, those who oppress you and the ones who drag you into court? Are they not the ones who blaspheme the honorable name by which you were called? Right? Um, now, this may sound a little bit about... To, to a, maybe a modern American, you're not all, but maybe to some, there's sort of class envy or bash the rich. You know, it's easy to bash the rich, you know? Uh, is, that, is that simply what James is doing here? So I think we need to do a little bit of thought about what the situation was like at that, that time. We, we live in a country where a person can come here with almost nothing and work hard, work up through the company ladder and become wealthy. Or in other words, there's an ability to move uh, up the ep economic ladder that doesn't exist right now, for example, in some parts of the world. But in the ancient world, you were pretty much born into something that's going to be pretty hard to break out of. If you were Poe, you're going to stay Poe. You know, um, the rich uh, were able to kind of guard and keep their uh, their little empires. And so there, there was a small, in Jesus' time, um, there was a working class. They were poor, but they were working poor. Um, and then there were the really destitutes, like the widows and orphans. And you find, for example, in a lot of parts of the world today, that there's a very big gap between people who are fabulously wealthy and those who are, are quite poor. Um, this is especially true, for example, in the, in the Caribbean islands or some of these resort areas where uh, the beaches look, are really fabulous. And two blocks inland, you see some almost shanty towns. Um, and um, there's almost nothing in between, no what we would call middle class. Hmm? And it, it, would be, it, it was very hard to break out of that system. Unlike in this country, we can come, you know, maybe go to school, study hard, get an education, do, you know, but you, you can work your way up and out. Um, now that that was utterly impossible in the ancient world, but it just wasn't a reality for most people. You know, you were pretty much born into your situation. And so um, I think here the idea uh, is, is um, that, um, that, that there, there was much more of an oppressive quality to the, to the rich, um, that, that the rich had toward the poor, even if it wasn't like they were mean-spirited, but they, they just locked out people from really uh, access to their world. Um, it was a kind of um, a clique or a, a small group, and they kind of stayed together and lived in these little enclaves, and they had tall walls around their house, and you know, that kind of stuff. So um, we see that um, um, and it, there was something oppressive about how they how they treat it. Now, again, there were always exceptions. And I think I, I, when I want to be very careful today that I do not think 
um, that we should bash the rich. Uh, there are many in our country, many very generous people who are wealthy. They're very generous. Um, maybe you say they should be more generous so they're not so rich. But again, there's different ways of, for example, maybe you're running a business that employs many thousands of people. Or maybe, you know, you can take some of your money instead of just throw it out the window here to the poor, you might be able to invest in some kind of a, um, an apprentice program or, you know, you see what I'm trying to say, there's different ways that the wealthy can you know, help not just writing checks, but some of them just because of the businesses they run or because they, um, they you know, they provide goods and services well and efficiently are helping people and they, and they provide them inexpensively, you know, so there are lots of different ways that I think we should be careful uh, in our time to not use a lot of really nasty language toward the rich. And you know who the rich guy is? He's that guy over there that earns a dollar more an hour than me. See, I'm never the rich guy. But guess what, y'all? You're Americans. We live in America. I mean, to be poor in America is like to be rich in Haiti. I mean, you know? I mean, we, 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 we don't know the kind of poverty that some other countries, just crushing poverty and uh, horrible medical systems and just anything. So we, we're already at the top of the pile, even the so-called poor among us, it's a very relative term because I'm gonna tell you right now, we don't know poverty, maybe in the backwoods of West Virginia or somewhere deep in the Appalachians, there might be some of this, but at the end of the day, you know, most of the poor in our country have running water, they have a, a home to live in, they even have air conditioning and television, and most of them I've noticed have cell phones. So, I mean, you know, um, now I'm not, trying to be dismissive. You know, there are people who have real financial struggles and issues like you were just talking about, Karen, you know, uh, they, they kind of work, at, you know, almost hand to mouth and check paycheck to paycheck and it's tight. So I'm not trying to make light of it, but I just think that before, <laughs> before we get into this bash, the rich stuff, we are living in the richest country that the, in the world and probably that the world has ever known. <laughs> And uh, so anyway, uh, I, I, but nevertheless, Jane sort of takes up this language and I wanted you to kind of get the cultural background to this because um, um, in, in a way he's speaking what was true, namely that it was mainly the, 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 the rich who oppressed the poor uh, and likewise the Roman government, you know, with heavy taxation and, and different things like this. And so, um, you know, now here comes this other question though, is this necessarily always true? Uh, he says here, um, um, has God, has not God chosen those who are poor in the world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom? Yeah. Um, he, remember Jesus said, blessed are the poor, blessed are the poor in spirit and so on. Uh, but does it follow that necessary that everybody who earns under $22,000 a year is, uh, is a godly person? You know, no, it doesn't. So in other words, um, Jesus had a special love for the poor, however. He reached out because, again, uh, one of the aspects of wealth in Jesus' time was that the temple leaders, the Sadducees, and many of the Pharisees were very wealthy men. And there was a lot of corruption in the temple. And they despised the poor. They looked down on them as the great unwashed. They don't keep the law. No wonder they're poor. They don't keep the law like we do. And so uh, instead of going out and preaching and loving them and trying to draw them deeper into a commitment to God or explain the scriptures to them more, they pretty much just left them out bereft. Uh, and so um, um, Jesus says, look, the harvest is rich, but the, but the preachers are few, you know, ask the Lord to send, you know, ask the Lord to send, you know, people into his vineyard, you know, and um, uh, so Jesus went out among the poor and he loved them and he taught them. So there's different ways that the rich would often oppress the poor. Um, Sometimes it was just simply by ignoring them and not knowing anything about their plight and walking past them and, and so on. So, and, and the poor, on the other hand, were very, initially very responsive, you know, to Jesus' word. Um, it was those, it was them that he first reached. And um, so when Jesus is standing there on the lakeside and he says, you are the light of the world, <laughs> you're the salt of the earth. He's talking to ordinary Galileans, fishermen, vineyard tenders, uh, you know, laborers. <laughs> He's not talking to the glitterati, to the people in Hollywood or uh, down down the street from here in the capital. He's talking to ordinary folks. He says, "You're the light of the world. You're the salt of the earth." You know, um, and uh, he, you know, so often the scriptures speak of God's special love for the poor. But again, to to some degree, the the Sadducees and the Pharisees 
um, were, uh, you know, just very ne negligent of the poor. And so I, I think we should just take James at his word that this is largely true. But then we come to that question, did all the poor necessarily come to Jesus? And then the answer is no, not all of them did, right? Not all of them did. But God had a special love for them and he called them first, okay? He called to them first. So this is, I think, the insight we want to take. Now, um, maybe one more thing to say about this. Um, you remember this um, saying of Jesus. Um, he says, make use of your uh, unrighteous mammon um, so that when it fails you, they, namely the poor, will welcome, oh, I'm sorry, make use of your unrighteous mammon to gain friends for yourself, okay? He's speaking here of the poor, so that when your wealth fails you, they will welcome you into eternal dwellings. And so Jesus says, in a way, befriend the poor. And um, in this world, the poor need us. But in the world to come, especially on, at the judgment, we're going to need them, <laughs> all right? And, and they're going to call a lot of the shots. Lord, you be good to this one. He was good to us, see? Uh, he took care of us, see? Uh, she took care of us, all right? So Jesus advises, um, you know, again, to store up treasure in heaven. Well, how do you store up something in heaven? You put it in a balloon? No, you put it in the hand of the poor and the needy. And it could be members of your own family. It isn't just go out and find some stranger and, you know, put money in there. And you could do that. But there's different ways of, and levels of neediness and how we care for people. Sometimes it's a family member. Um, but you see the idea. Um, the Lord is saying here that um, that the poor have a very powerful place. The Lord hears the cry of the poor. Um, and um, Jesus suggests that very much that if, if we are good to the poor, they will testify on our behalf on the day of judgment. He said to the um, Pharisees who love wealth, he said, Oh, you scribes, you Pharisees, you hypocrites, you brood of vipers, you know, you oppress the poor. He goes on and talks about all this. And then he says, But give alms and everything will be forgiven. <laughs> Now, that almost sounds dangerously close to saying um, you can buy your way into heaven. That's not what he's getting at. But he's saying that change your heart. See, love the poor. Be generous to them. See, because they're, they're very powerful. They have my ear. And, you know, so sometimes it's good to befriend a poor person. Say, I really need you to pray for me. See, or find somebody who's sick. You know, um, I always say to people when I visit them in the hospital, they're flat on their back. You, your prayers have never been more powerful than they are right now. Flat on your back. Uh, just, just give it to the Lord and pray for us. Pray for me. Uh, because again, the Lord hears the, the cry of the poor, of the sick, the needy, uh, the powerless. You see, he, he, they have his ear. And so instead of looking down, we ought to almost look up and esteem them and say, I, I need your help. I can help you with a little generosity, but I, I really need your prayers too, see? And we can't help everybody, but at least we can show them the, the, some dignity, okay? Fair enough? Monsignor? Mm-hmm. Uh, back when he was still Father Barron, uh, about six or seven years ago, uh, Father Barron gave a homily uh, on the uh, Lazarus and the rich man, mm. and, he, and he referred to the fact that he'd come in from Mundelein Seminary to go to the Chancery several times a week, and every time he got off the expressway, he said there was this beggar there. Mm -hmm. He said it always bothered him because sometimes he'd stop and give him something. Sometimes he just kind of drove by. And he finally concluded that uh, that the, the, that person was like was like Lazarus. He's actually your entrance to heaven. They're there not as an obstacle, but as your gateway to 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 be with the Lord. And they're, yeah. so they're they're a gift in your in your presence, not someone to be avoided. Yeah, and you know, as Aaron always does, he, he puts it just perfectly, doesn't he? I mean, he's just um, very gifted. Yeah. I, um, we had a Lazarus in my, when I worked at the Army Corps of Engineers down on Mass Avenue here, way back in the early 80s, and an old guy that lived in the, in the trash area in the back. And, you know, we'd always say, can we get you a shelter? We'd give him food and stuff, but uh, then he wouldn't go to a shelter because he was too scared. And he did die one night uh, in, in a very cold night, and we all felt terrible. But all of us knew, all of us knew Joe. He was a, we didn't even know that was a real name. He just told me, told us his name was Joe. But, um, he, you know, and the whole building turned out for the funeral, you know. And uh, uh, so, again, there are, there are many blessings the poor can bring us, you know. And we can't always help them. Sometimes they're not willing to be helped, especially some of the ones who live out in the streets. You know, they don't want to go to a shelter. They don't want medical care, you know. Um, but 
we, we do the best we can. Okay, I'm, I'm spending too much time, so we'll move on. But you see the vision here, right? Which is um, the poor are in a way very blessed by God to have the faith and God, he, they certainly have God's ear. Verse eight, if you, if you really fulfill the royal law, according to the scripture, uh, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, you're doing well. Sometimes it's called the golden rule, right? Or the, you know, the royal law. But if you show partiality, you are committing sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. Now, he then quotes a saying from the Old Testament. For whoever keeps the whole law but fails in one point has become guilty of all of it. For he who said do not commit adultery also said do not murder. And if you do not commit adultery but do murder, you have become a transgressor of the law. So then always speak and act as those who are to be judged under the law of liberty. For judgment is without mercy to the one who has shown no mercy, but mercy triumphs over judgment. And some of you may remember I quoted that this past um, weekend in the homily. Now, again, um, let's take uh, what, there's one particular thing. I, this idea of you, 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 if you, 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 you break one of the commandments, you've broken all, uh, you break the whole law. Now, how does that work? Well, let me just give you an analogy, maybe to help you to appreciate. Let's say you give me, and I know we all have GPS devices now, but let's just say before that era, you wrote down 10 instructions for me to get to your house. So, you know, you go down East Capitol and you turn right on 17th and you go three blocks and you turn, you know, and you get the idea. And I, I say, well, I'll, I'll keep all of these, but this one here, I'm not, it says I'm supposed to turn right. I don't really like to be told what to do. I'm not into turning right. So I'm just going to turn left. Now, you see, one, so all 10 of those things need to be followed. And if you just break one of them, the whole thing falls apart, right? And so we have to understand that um, we like to think that we can just kind of select and do something to keep part of the law and, and so on. Now, what's implied here is that even beyond the Ten Commandments, there are things that God expects of us, that we should show mercy, that we should be generous, that we should not be a respecter of persons, that we should, uh, not, show no, we should not show partiality or discriminate. Um, these are things that God expects of us. And if we want to just say, well, I don't have to worry about that, but I am keeping these things over here. Again, you find, you're going to find that uh, the whole thing comes tumbling down um, because, um, you know, God cares about these things. He cares about how we treat the poor. He, it's very important to him. In fact, an awful lot of scripture is, 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 is devoted to this topic, you know? And um, so uh, we, um, we, we, you know, it's not, that's not all the Bible says, but it, it's a very important thing to God, how we treat immigrants, the stranger, how we treat the poor and the needy. Uh, it's very important to God. Okay. By the way, it's an interesting thing, uh, an interesting question in Matthew 25, the great judgment scene. And it, it says the books are open and, and, and he, he separates them like sheep from goats. And you know the list. Uh, when I was to those on his right, you know, come you blessed to my father. For when I was hungry, you fed me. I was thirsty, you gave me drink, and so on. And he lists what are the corporal works of mercy. Now, there's what there's so much stuff that's not said on that judgment. Like, uh, you know, you you call you called me Lord. You've accepted my um, uh, my lordship or my divinity. Um, you've you've been, you've been chased. Um, you have um, you know you know you get the idea. There's a lot of stuff that's not mentioned there, and a lot of people think that this is kind of the Christian equivalent of the Noharitic law wherein um, the, um, for those who didn't have, who weren't schooled in the full Jewish understanding of what should be done, God would judge them on kind of the standard of what we might call being naturally good to other people. Um, like all the things in that list, you know, visiting them when they're sick or in prison, um, you know, um, feeding them when they're hungry, um, you know, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. And, and, and this is kind of the, the standard that would be used because it can't be the standard for a Christian. There's much more required of us than just the, the corporal works of mercy, right? I hope you know that. So I'm afraid some people like to take that passage and say, see, God doesn't care about all this other stuff. He doesn't care if you're sleeping with your girlfriend. He doesn't care if you're not, um, um, you know, if you're not going to church on Sunday. He doesn't care about any of that stuff. Uh, look, is, he, is, that, is any of that on this list? And that's not, that's, that's probably not what that passage is about. And it's certainly not a complete list of the things that God will mention or care, will care about. Okay? All right. Uh, now, um, okay, again, and we, we talked a little bit about this last line. 
look, be careful. Um, you and I are going to go to the judgment seat one day, and we are going to need God to use a merciful standard because he's going to judge with strict justice. Romans 2 says that God judges us, everyone, according to their deeds. But So you might say, well, if it's all strict justice, where's mercy going to be on the day of judgment? Simply this, part of God's justice is to say, if you have been merciful and forgiving and generous, I will, fact, this is, uh, I will, I will judge you on this kind of a standard. But if you've been mean-spirited, stingy, hypercritical, and, and, and so on, I'm going to use a strict judgment for you. If, you. if you've been unmerciful, I'll take that into account when I judge you. I'll judge you with a strict standard, which you probably won't be able to meet. So this is part of God's justice. That he will, you know, it says the measure that you measure out to others will be measured back to you, see. Uh, and that's understood, first of all, in terms of generosity, but also just in terms of how we treat people and whether we're harsh. And again, look, there is a time where we have to punish and we have to hold people accountable and let them experience some of the consequences of their wrongdoing. So I'm not, it's not saying there's never a time to say this will end. Um, but, um, but as a general norm, I would strongly advise you, as I would advise myself, to show mercy, patience, <laughs> and be generous, because you're going to need that stuff on the day of judgment. I don't know if you've noticed, but God is very holy. Okay. okay. Now, here we come into a, a great um, debate, sort of, uh, between Catholics and Protestants, and I think it's been... Uh, it's so tiring, and I think it's, it's, it's ultimately such a foolish debate, because I really think Catholics and Protestants are saying the same thing. Now, there may be a different emphasis, right? But I think at least as the decade or the centuries have gone past, since Luther has come and gone, that we've, we've pretty much adopted a language that's pretty similar, and I'll get to that in a minute, but let's read the text, all right? I don't know, Seth, why don't you go ahead and read, uh, go ahead and read just the first 14 through um, 16? Okay. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> what does it profit, my brethren, if a man says he has faith, but has not works? Can his faith save him? A brother or sister is poorly clothed and in lack of daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, be warmed and filled, without giving them the things needed for the body, what does it profit? Uh, you go ahead and read the next verse, I guess. Okay. So faith by itself has no works. Or faith by itself, if it has no works, is dead. Yeah. Okay. Now, in effect, I think the best way to see this is that faith is a fruit-bearing tree. The Lord saves us without us. You know, St. Augustine said, he who made you without you will not save you without you. So um, we, uh, we, we consent to this great work of God in our life. And what is the very first gift that he brings alive in us as he saves us? We as Catholics would argue at baptism, some of the Protestants say when you make a, the Jesus prayer or something. But the point is you come to a moment when you give consent to the Lord to enter your life. And the very first thing he puts to work is faith in our life. And it is by this faith that we will be saved by trusting God. But faith is not an abstraction. It's not, it's not just words in a book like a creed or a catechism. It is those things. Don't, don't, there is a substance or a content, I should say, to faith. But faith is much more. It's a trusting relationship with the Lord that bears fruit. And there's, 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 it's a fruit-bearing tree because our relationship with the Lord changes us. We see sins being put to death. Grace is coming alive, just like we've been talking about. We become more generous, more merciful, more kind. Why? Because we trust God. He's been good to me. He's, he, I, I can be generous because he's been generous with me. I, I, um, I, you know, I, I, this relationship I have is changing my life and changing my heart. I'm even starting to love my enemy. You cannot go to Jesus Christ and come away unchanged. If you authentically experience him in your life, you are not, you can't come away unchanged. Uh, if you go to him with a hard heart, you, you have lip service faith, well, that's, that's nothing. See, he's saying that kind of faith without any works is, is dead, is dead. Now, some people want to oppose Paul's text um, where he says, uh, for um, um, 
uh, he says, um, oh, help me out here, uh, Kyle, Seth, um, Romans uh, 3, I know. But anyway, Paul argues that um, Abraham was saved by faith apart from works of the law. All right, um, ergon tu nomu is the Greek. Now, it's a very debated thing. What works is Paul saying? He says, notice he says works of the law, okay? Not just works, but ergon tu nomu, works of the law. Hmm? And so, in other words, I think what Paul's really getting at there is that, 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 that not that there's no works uh, in faith, but rather we're not saved by those works. Those works are, if you will, the fruit of being in a saving relationship. The works don't save us. The relationship that bears those fruits is what saves us. So I, I don't care if you built a major hospital for the poor. You go to the judgment seat. You can't say, look what I did. You can just say to God, thank you. You did that. You gave me the grace and the money and the strength and the power to do that. See, so there's nothing that you can do that isn't first God's gift to you. You know, you can't say, here, God, I've done something for you. Um, no, I, <laughs> I actually accomplished that in you. <laughs> and good, you cooperate. There is something we call merit. I don't have time to develop it all right now. But St. Augustine basically says, so good is God to us that he allows his works to become our merits. Okay, but they're his works, you see, in which we cooperate. Um, so this idea of faith with works, faith without works, all this. First of all, Catholics are not saying we are saved by works. Now, Protestants have said for you know, years and years, that's what they're saying. That's not what we're saying. And we never said that. And if you go read the Council of Trent and parse all those things, you can see we reject that. And likewise, I don't think Protestants are saying works are absolutely, um, no, they don't matter. They have nothing to, you know, because obviously, why would you even go to church and have the preacher exhorting you to do anything if Protestants thought like that? So I think what we do is we caricature each other's positions for over almost 500 years and started throwing stones at what weren't even really our positions. They were straw men. So the, the, the solution for both groups, I think, is most, more nuanced. And I think over the years, we, we're, we're less clenched fist about it. And in fact, the, some of the Lutherans, not all of them, not the Missouri Synod and Lutherans, I can promise you. Um, but uh, the, other, the other three branches of Lutheranism actually signed an agreement um, with the Catholic Church said, look, we're fundamentally in agreement with this. We have slightly different emphasis and some of our language is different, but we're in fundamental agreement uh, that we all agree we're saved by Jesus Christ apart from, any, apart from works of the law, but that brings us into a saving relationship which bears fruit. Uh, it, it, faith, if it's going to be real, is going to bear fruit. Otherwise, it's dead. It's, it's, it's not really there at all, says, uh, says James. And I think I think that's the best way to try to resolve it. So I, maybe this is all academic to you, but I'm going to tell you, it's been a battle royal in the, in the Western church for 500 years now. Okay. And, um, but any comments, questions or rebuttals or distinctions? I mean, Seth, you, uh, you have a background that uh, might help us here. Yeah, I do. And um, so, and interestingly, uh, I have a little, uh, podcast that I'm some, sometimes on uh, Theological College has one. And I did a, a podcast on ecumenical dialogue. That is to say, mm -hmm. um, the dialogue between the Catholic Church and, and some other denomination. And in mm -hmm. that, I interviewed um, a Methodist who was uh, a professor over at, um, uh, what is it, Wesley Seminary here in Washington, D.C. Yeah, right. And, uh, and so, in that conversation, um, when we get to, to talk about this kind of very same thing very deeply, and uh, we were talking about in 1999, there was this document signed called the Joint Declaration on Justification mm -hmm. by Faith. And uh, that document, just like you were saying, Monsignor, was originally signed on by the, the uh, Lutheran World Federation. Mm -hmm. Then it was signed on uh, by the World Methodist Council, and then it was signed on to just recently, I think it was 2017, um, by the World Communion of Reformed Churches, mm -hmm. and also by the uh, Anglican movement. I can't remember what that is exactly called, yeah. but just let's just say the Anglican Communion. Mm -hmm. And this is like a very, very, very significant number 
of Protestant churches that have uh, formally said that the uh, understanding, let me say the misunderstanding of how we had different perspectives on justification by faith uh, is basically null and void. There are, like you were saying, there are different things that we're emphasizing, um, but there is fundamentally no significant difference. Um, and we, you know, so I used to be a Methodist uh, before I became Catholic. I was actually at a, a Methodist seminary uh, for four years. And uh, within that, we studied this guy named John Wesley, who was the founder of Methodism. And he vociferously preached against what he called antinomianism, which was this idea of uh, kind of an anti-law or an anti-holiness perspective on Christianity. And so uh, within that idea, works were absolutely fundamental to what it meant to be a Christian, that one's faith would be proved, proven by what they did. Uh, and so just as you're saying, Monsignor, uh, there are different things that we emphasize, yeah. but on the basic level, uh, we're, we're on the same, we're in the same place. Yeah. Good. Kyle, why don't you just pick up here? Uh, cause he's going to give the example of Abraham. And this is, this is what illustrate what Seth was saying, how Paul and James are, are looking at Abraham at, but they're, 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 they're emphasizing something slightly different. Okay. So maybe Kyle, you could read beginning there, 18 down through 20, 26 or yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 26. I think we'll be good. Okay. I also have the um, new, new American Bible. So maybe it'll be a little different, but we'll see mm-hmm. how it goes. Indeed, someone might say, you have faith and I have works. Demonstrate your faith to me without works, and I will demonstrate my faith to you from my works. You believe that God is one. You do well. Even the demons believe that and tremble. Do you want proof, you ignoramus, that faith without works is useless? Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered his son Isaac upon the altar? You see that faith was active along with his works, and faith was completed by the works. Thus the scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. And he was called the friend of God. See how a person is justified by works, and not by faith alone. And in the same way, was not Rahab the harlot also justified by works when she welcomed the messengers and sent them out by a different route? For just as a body without a spirit is dead, so also without works. So also faith without works is dead. Okay. Now, um, the, um, let me see here. I'm just looking up Paul's treatment of this in Romans 3. Um, I hope, by the way, this isn't too, too much heavy weather for you all. I mean, um, okay. Sometimes Bible study, does a, we have to do a little heavy lifting. Okay. I mean, really, these are things that have utterly preoccupied for 500 years, a huge section of the Christian world. Um, I'm sorry, is, uh, are you, um, Daryl, are you trying to say? Uh, you have to unmute. Let's see, I can try to unmute you there. Okay. Okay, can you, all right. Mm-hmm. Okay, I'm, I've been trying to follow along, but you kind of lost me. Now, what is, what is the conflict, I want to call it that, between Protestants' version of faith and, and works, why is it different than ours? That, when you started that, I was kind of got a little bit lost. Mm-hmm. What, is, what is the conflict for over 500 years between? Yeah, the, uh, the, 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 this overly simplistic view is that Catholics believe we're saved by works and Protestants don't. They think we're just saved by faith and Luther would say faith alone. Okay. Um, and uh, therefore... Uh, you know, as I say, and, and uh, we were trying to uh, examine, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to show you that I think the way to resolve the conflict is that Paul is emphasizing a relationship that bears fruit, whereas in James is emphasizing the fruits that come from that relationship. But it's the same thing. So like, I, I enter into a relationship with Jesus Christ, and like a fruit-bearing tree, I bear fruits. 
Um, I can say uh, I'm an orange tree, but if there's acorns hanging in the branches, I'm a liar. So we got to find there are works of faith that will clearly be manifested in a person who's in a right relationship. Paul basically says in Romans that um, for we hold that a, a man is justified by, by faith apart from works of the law. Um, and he uses the example of Abraham. Um, and, uh, he, um, he says, uh, for the promise to Abraham that his offspring would be heir of the world did not come through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. Okay. So he's saying that Abraham was saved apart from works of the law. Okay. Whereas James seems to be saying the opposite. Look, look, he's, um, see what Abraham did. He was doing all these works. Okay. So I think the way to resolve this is not a conflict in God's word, but what I said earlier, um, which is that Paul is emphasizing the relationship. Dikiosune is a very relational word in Greek. It means to enter into a right relationship with God. Um, and that then produces the fruits. Um, that, and, and, and James is working it backwards. He's saying, look, there's got to be, if, if, if you say you have faith and you're in this you know, transformative relationship with Jesus, then there need to be works that show, that show evidence of that. Now, he then goes on to say, can't you see, look, Abraham, once he was in this right relationship, was obeying God, he's building altars. Sometimes he wasn't obeying God and running off to Egypt, but, but he eventually got to the point where, you know, he, he, he was even able and willing to sacrifice his own son if God told him to do it. So this, th these are the works of that right relationship. So that would be my solution. Um, am I getting too heavy? How about Seth, you want to add anything to it just because of your background or would that be? Yeah, I think you said it very, very well. I mean, it, it comes down to Protestants, faith, faith alone. Pretty much every Protestant denomination says you're saved by faith alone. Yeah. Um, Lutherans especially, but, but pretty much every Protestant denomination says you're saved by faith alone, full stop. Yeah. But then the question becomes, what is real faith? Yeah. And real faith works. Okay. Um, but then the Catholics will say, well, yeah, you are saved by faith, but you have to work. And so it's, it's just this different ways of talking about the same thing, but we've been talking past one another for 500 years. Yeah. And um, it's, it, it, it's like really simple. It's just like, what does it mean to live a real Christian, a vibrant Christian faith? It means that I will bear fruit. Um, if you don't, then it's, it's not real faith. Um, it's yeah. just kind of like a nominal faith. And by nominal, we mean in name only, mm -hmm. yeah. uh, not real, yeah. a pretend faith. Um, and so... That would be the case for either Protestant or Catholic. But um, in the one hand, it would say, on the Protestant side, you say, it was never real faith because it didn't work. On the Catholic side, it would say, faith was, or, uh, faith was present, but works were absent. Mm -hmm. yeah. Basically the so same. It wasn't really faith, yeah. So, by the way, just to maybe add to the... <laughs> oh, did you want to add one thing? Because I you're about to say something. Okay. Um, you'll notice that he's also a little dismissive of simply a creedal faith. Uh, you believe that God is one, you do well, but even demons believe that and tremble. So in other words, while we want to have our creed and we want to have our catechism, please don't go and invent your own religion. The content is important, but he's not thinking here of, well, I have faith. I can say the whole creed by memory. Well, no, the, 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 that's a, just a kind of a creedal faith, but a more fiduciary or trusting relational faith is what's really he's emphasizing here, right? And so Paul's doing the very same thing. He's saying, look, uh, you don't just recite prayers and recite laws. or uh, You're in a relationship, and it's that relationship that saves you, and it bears fruit. So, again, maybe just to get back to don't lie, um, if I tell you I'm an orange tree, and you don't see any oranges in the branches? Say, well, let me come back next year and see if maybe I, and then you see acorns hanging in the branches. Okay, I can say I'm an orange tree, but I'm not bearing the fruits that come from, from really being an orange tree. So it's, it's dead or it's a, it's a lie. Mm -hmm. And so this is where uh, I think we can resolve these things, okay? And as, at least as best we can for now, because 
Whew. Monsignor. Uh, uh, Ken Mackey and I followed Father John Ricardo a fair amount. He's got a pretty simple definition for faith. It's called faith is God's work in us to which we respond. Yeah. And which basically takes the, mm -hmm. the action part. God does, God does the work we respond by, by what, by being faithful. And, and, and basically we flower and we, we, it shows. So. And even our response is assisted by grace. Yeah. 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 So, okay. Well, all right. We, we uh, better move on from this topic, but uh, now we, we're coming to the point where we're into the th uh, third chapter. If you wouldn't mind, let's just do the first part. Cause remember last week we talked about the tongue and I said, he has more to say about this. Okay. And therefore, um, I don't know, Kai, why don't you just keep reading, uh, starting with chapter three there, at least read the first, um, I don't know, four or five verses, five, the first five verses. Not many of you should become teachers, my brothers, for you will realize, for you realize that we will be judged more strictly, for we all fall short in many respects. If anyone does not fall short in speech, he is a, he is a perfect man, able to bridle his whole body also. If we put bits into the mouth of horses to make them obey us, we also guide their whole bodies. It is the same with ships. Even though they are large and driven by fierce winds, they are steered by a very small rudder, wherever the pilot's inclination wishes. In the same way, the tongue is a small member, and yet has great pretensions. Consider yeah. how small well, Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, that, keep reading that. That makes sense. Yeah. Consider how a small fire can set a huge forest to blaze. How about that? Yeah, and just continue on because it's, it's pretty much all together. The tongue is also a fire. It exists among our, our members as a world of malice, defiling the whole body and setting the entire course of our lives on fire, itself set on fire by Gehenna. For every kind of beast and bird, of reptile and sea creature, can be tamed and has been tamed by the human species. But no human being can tame the tongue. It is, restless, it is a restless evil full of deadly poison. With it, we bless the Lord and Father. And with it, we curse human beings who are made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth come blessing and cursing. This need not be so, my brothers. Does a spring gush forth from the same opening, both pure and brackish water? Can a fig tree, my brothers, produce olives or a grapevine figs? Neither can salt water yield fresh. Yeah. So <laughs> he really worked up here, isn't he, right? Listen, just send this one, this middle section again. I mean, kind of read it sort of in a preaching style. It says, oh, my brothers, the tongue is set among our members, straining the whole body. It sets the on fire the entire course of our life, and it, it itself is set on fire by hell itself. <laughs> For every kind of beast can be tamed but um, uh, by human beings, but no human being can tame the tongue. It's a restless evil, full of deadly poison. We bless the Lord and Father, and then we curse people made in his image. It should not be so, my brother. And you can hear him getting worked up and people going, amen, ooh, you know, and ooh, he's stepping on my toes, preacher, you know, that kind of a thing. So um, we, um, we want to um, definitely, um, uh, obviously, he, he's emphasizing that what we know, we can say things that we can never take back. You can't unring the bell. And there have been people who have said things to other people that they can never unsay. Um, it's a very, we can say some of the most awful things to people and really hurt them. People say names, or sticks and stones may break my bones, but names will never hurt me. Yes, they will. They do. The, 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 there can be very hurtful things that we do with our, and he uses that image of just a small spark can set a whole forest ablaze. And it's just, the tongue is not that big a part of our body, but boy, is it pretentious and powerful. And obviously, he doesn't develop it as much, but the real goal then is, is to try to use our beautiful gift of speech to uh, upbuild, to, keep, to, to speak and proclaim truth, uh, to uh, console, at times challenge, but always with love. Um, and, uh, you know, say, say, that, say only the good things men need to hear, things that will really help them, says St. Paul uh, elsewhere. So again, we have, um, uh, you know, I, I have, by the way, on my blog from last week, uh, you know, some sins of, I think I, re I reviewed it with you, the lying tongue, the forked tongue, the you know, uh, there's so many things that we can do uh, that can really, really cause harm. And, um, you know, when we think of some of the racial um, 
tensions and injustice in our land. We think of some of the words we've used back and forth. Um, we, um, and it's not just toward African Americans, but I remember as a kid growing up, a, a good number of you are older than I am. And you remember, we, we, we told the most awful ethnic jokes and, you know, just terrible, you know, things like that. And uh, we don't need to, of course, mention the N word and how painful that can be, you see. Um, all of these kinds of things uh, can cause great, great harm and, um, and bitterness. So I think we have to um, really ask the Lord, um, Lord, keep your arm around my shoulder and your hand over my mouth. Um, because I, I too easily say things that I probably shouldn't. I, I can gossip. I could, by that, I could ruin somebody's reputation or at least cause others to scorn them. Um, I can, uh, if I lie or misrepresent the truth, uh, I can cause great harm. Um, you know, I can say terrible things, um, hurt people very deeply. So then, Lord, help me to use my tongue uh, to to calm, to encourage, to give people the truth. Uh, help me to use my tongue to teach and edify and build people up. Uh, I might have to challenge at the time, even punish or scold, but I I I, I do that judiciously and carefully. Hmm? So again, these are the kinds of things where um, we, um, we do very well to be much more reflective before we speak. And we're often halfway through saying something before we've even thought about it. So, okay, I think enough said on that, but I thought I wanted to get through this first uh, piece, um, which was pretty quick. And we can also then um, um, uh, finish the chapter here in just a moment. But any thoughts on this question of the tongue? I mean, I think we all know how true it can be, right? It's almost a truism, isn't it? You know, what he's saying here. Um, oh, be very, very careful. Be, be very judicious in what you say. And um, yeah, I have said things and I, that I deeply regretted, even to this day. Didn't Jesus say something similar when, uh, when they were talking about the 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 foods that went in the, oh, yeah. the, the body is not the foods, but the, what comes out of the mouth. That uh, yeah, he actually says heart. There, it's what comes out of a, out of our heart. Yeah, but yeah, mm -hmm. but it's a similar idea, right? Yeah. <laughs> right. All right. Um, let's just finish out this chapter. And part of what I'm trying to do is make some room for um, Seth, uh, who's gonna. Uh, would like to uh, work with you on 1 Peter, um, uh, the first letter of Peter, which is the very next book in this Bible. So I'm trying to get through a couple of chapters today and clear some room so we can finish out James next week. Is that okay, Seth? I mean, I'm kind of putting you on the spot, but okay. All right. And then we'll have to make sure that you can get enough time in before you leave for uh, your November break, right? But I think it'll be almost two months. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it'll, it'll be great. Okay. Um, a warning against world, I'm sorry, uh, wisdom is from above. I'll just finish this out. Who is wise in understanding among you? By his good conduct, let him then show uh, his works in meekness of wisdom. But if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast and be false to the truth. This is not the wisdom that comes down from above, but is earthly and unspiritual and demonic. Now, what I think he's talking about here is, again, um, to humbly, meekly preach the word of God is, is what we do. But what happens is we get our own opinions going and stubbornness and we need to put it exactly this way. And, and all of a sudden, um, we're, we're, um, um, we're boasting and we're, we're being false to the truth, maybe by only partially representing it or, or, or trying to add to it or, uh, take things out of context or overemphasize something. So, Every heresy, by the way, has some element of truth in it, but it's, 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 it's exaggerated or it doesn't have the opposite thing to balance it, right? Uh, very often there are tensions like, is God sovereign or are we free? The heretic says, I cannot abide this tension, so they pick one and throw the, and throw, throw the other thing away, whereas orthodoxy holds the tension. It holds the balance and says both are true and they're meant to balance each other, and I don't want to say much more about it except that this is what he's talking about, this kind of stuff where people stray off 
and they're too opinionated. Instead of just frankly preaching the word of God as it's written, they start to develop lots of little weird things. And well, um, Paul was a misogynist, so we don't need to listen to what he says here. And he was a homophobe, so we'll just cross out that line. And you know, you get the idea. This is where um, uh, some people go with the word of God. And he says, this is demonic. He's very clear with this. It's, it's demonic. It's, um, um, yeah, let's see. Um, this is not the wisdom that comes down from above, but is earthly, unspiritual, and demonic. For where there is jealousy and selfish ambition exist, I'm a better teacher, you're a better teacher, ambition, I want to get places, you know, that kind of stuff. We gainsay the word of God. We falsely represent it, right? Uh, but the wisdom that is from above is, first of all, pure. In other words, at pure here, I think it's katharos in, in Greek. Pure here, does it... It means to be simply itself, not, not admixed with anything else. Um, sometimes the, the word katharoi can be translated not just pure, but, um, but simple. The thing itself, without any, anything admixed to it, okay? Like putting raisins in potato salad, <laughs> something like that. Okay, now um, the wisdom is first of all pure. It is peaceable, okay? We're not trying just to win an argument and beat people over the head, all right? It is gentle, okay, similar idea, okay. I, I think the Greek word here that's, tra I'd have to look it up, but is, um, mm, oh, come on, I know the word. Um, my yoke is easy, my, my yoke is easy. My, word the, anyway, uh, gentle means to be well-suited, like um, um, an old shoe fits perfectly, right? You know, you, I love my old shoes, and, um, uh, it, it's 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 gentle in that sense that it, it's well suited or well fitting. So a gentle person isn't just always kind and nice. Sometimes a gentle, a, a truly um, this Greek this Greek word talks about gentleness as being suitable to the moment. So sometimes I have to be strict and insist. Other times I I can let it go. Um, so it means to be well fitting or well suited to the moment, okay? So a teacher sometimes has to insist on something and correct a student when they've said something wrong. Other times they can let it go or uh, deal with it later. And so it's just gonna vary based on prudence. So uh, wisdom that is from above is pure, peaceable, gentle, open to reason. Um, so that we think this isn't just what God is saying, but Here's why it makes some sense. We, we ponder it. It's, it's, God doesn't just say, obey me blindly. He gave us intellects and wants us to, wants us to, do, um, um, to consider his word. All right. Finally, it says, goes up and says, full of mercy and good works, impartial and sincere. Impartial is very interesting. Um, you know how a, a politician might say something to one audience and say the opposite to the next audience? There's a, there's a funny story told about Perón down in Argentina. Um, he, his son went along with him and he went to one group and he said, um, I agree with you. And he went to another group who, who held the opposite position and said, I agree with you. Um, and his son said, uh, his son said, uh, but dad, you said I agree with you to two very different groups to opposite propositions. He says, son, I agree with you. <laughs> so, <laughs> so the, the idea is that uh, we can be duplicitous because we're trying to please the crowd, see? And this is part of the problem of hypocrisy, that hi the word hypocrisy comes from the Greek word for actor. So um, why would a, you know, an actor, if he's in front of one audience playing one role, may will do this, and then the audience changes, so he changes the message. And that's where why we kind of get this idea of hypocrisy. Uh, when the audience changes, um, the, uh, the message changes, you see. Instead, so it's got it's to be uh, impartial. In other words, whoever the audience is, I'm going to say God's word, okay? Um, and, and sincere, sincere. Most of you I might, I may have heard me say this before, but the word sincere is a very interesting etymology. Um, it literally comes from two Latin words, sine sera, without wax. So it comes from the idea that these, the Romans would build these marble columns. But marble, when it comes out of the earth, sometimes has these sort of holes in it or pock marks. And if you've ever seen it, you know, it, it, and they have to be filled with resin or a wax. I don't know if you have a granite countertop, but every now and again, there's pits in it or whatever, and they fill it in with a, 
a hard resin or wax. And the Romans did this too. But every now and again, they'd find a perfect piece of marble and say, ah, sine sera, without wax. There's the, this is the true thing. There's nothing phony here going on. No cosmetics. This is the real thing. See, so sincere means, you know, to be the real thing without any phoniness or cosmetics. Okay. Uh, okay, finally then, um, uh, and a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. So our, 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 our in thoughts of uh, the wisdom of God, both our reflections on it, it equips us but, uh, for, for works uh, of peace, but also uh, it equips us to, to, speak, to speak this word with all the qualities that he said. Okay, and I think uh, we can, if you have any comments or questions, we'll uh, do them, but we'll start wrapping up now. And we'll do four and five next week, and then we'll have uh, Seth begin to lead us through First Peter. Okay. Um, all right, comments, questions, rebuttals. <laughs> I realize that if it was, some of this was a little heavy tonight, um, uh, but um, you know, it's, it's the kind of a thing you really ought to know as a Catholic, because we have Protestant brothers and sisters, and um, some of you again are older than I am, and you remember it used to be a lot more. Um, it used to be a lot more uh, nasty between Catholics and Protestants. Um, we used to really argue out loud and fight a lot in public, much more than we do today. Um, I think you know, there's an old saying that warring brothers reconcile when there's a maniac at the door. You know, uh, and there is a maniac at the door right now. It's called Western, uh, I would call it um, militant fierce secularism. Hmm? and the doctrines of demons. And there's a, there's a maniac at the door right now. And so sometimes warring brothers reconcile. One of the things that united the, the Pentecostals um, and Catholics was the pro-life movement. And we worked together and learned to respect each other in, in that battle for life. Um, and uh, so there's been a lot of healing of some of these rifts in my lifetime. But when I was a young man, oh, we said terrible things about the Protestants. They're gonna, you know, and they said terrible things about us, you know? Um, so I did to some of the, there, there, there is a few that still have the old time religion. Uh, Missouri Synod Lutherans are like this. Um, I one time did a wedding of a, of a woman, uh, the, the, the bride was, um, uh, her father was a Missouri Synod Lutheran pastor. And he's not even technically allowed to come into a Catholic church. So he, it was agreed by their board of elders or whatever that he could come to the Catholic church if he had two men on either side of him. Uh, to rescue him from any error or anything that might uh, I might say he didn't know me personally but any terrible thing that I might say and and so he came up and introduced himself to me and there were these two I was let me I'm just kidding you know me my two friends Tony hey how you doing and Vito hey hey how you doing you know I mean they were all kind they were very kind and you know I said I I was in a funny mood, so I said to him, you know, I understand that it's hard for you to be here today, and you probably think I'm going to hell. And he, he kind of shrugged, and I said, I respect that about you. I respect that. I mean, you still believe very strongly, and you believe so strongly that I think you're wrong, but I think I'm going to go, I think I'm going to be in heaven, and I hope you'll be there with me. But I will say that I, I respect um, that you have a, a firm conviction about your faith, and you don't just sort of wish you and anyway we parted great friends he really enjoyed the homily and um um you know all of that kind of stuff um i think the um um yeah so I, all i can say is i i think the um let me see if i can get that off no all right um just finally to say that um i think things are really improved between catholics and protestants um at least the um the pentecostals and and so on all right and most of the old mainline churches are kind of getting elderly and old and they don't have a lot of uh, numbers. And so I don't know what's going to happen, but we'll have to attain better unity if we're going to fight a common enemy, which I think is very fierce militant secularism. Okay. All right. I talk too much. Okay. Um, all right. Now, how about, um, I don't know, Seth, why don't you lead us out in a prayer and I'll give a blessing. Absolutely. Well, let's uh, go to God in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, Holy Lord, thank you so very much for everything you've done for us this evening. Thank you for bringing us all together. Uh, be able to learn so many great things from uh, your great servant, James. 
uh, ask you help us to grab a hold of so many of these wonderful truths so that we may be people who don't show partiality, um, who are able to live lives with uh, a tongue that is more or less truly tamed uh, yeah. by the power of the Holy Spirit, uh, so that our minds may not be stuck in waves of uh, wickedness and evil, but may be opened up to all of the amazing uh, inspirations that you desire to shine in our hearts and in our lives. Yeah. God Almighty, we ask that you empower us to be your servants to your will and walk in the amazing paths of righteousness that you've called us to. We pray this all through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And may Almighty God bless you all, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. All right. Amen. Thank you. Okay. We'll see you next week. Bye, all. Peace, everybody. Thank you, Auntie. Good night, all. Good night, all. Take care. Peace. Good night. Good night.